Thank you so much for joining us this morning uh, for this discussion on enhancing U.S. engagement on maternal and child health. <coughs> my name is Talia Dubovi, and I am the Deputy Director of the Global Health Policy Center at CSIS. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Um, before we get started, I want to thank Senator Warren and Ashley Colomb on her staff for hosting us here this morning. Um, special thank you as well to my colleague Catherine Streifel for all her good work pulling this event together, <coughs> as well as Jesse Swanson, Chris Millard, and Ariane Malexade for their help. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with our work, the Global Health Policy Center works to provide strategic, long-term, and actionable recommendations to U.S. policymakers in order to make U.S. global health efforts efficient, effective, and sustainable. Uh, formed in 2008, the center grew out of an earlier HIV AIDS task force um, that was chaired by then Senators Kerry and Frist and played a role in the congressional authorization of PEPFAR. The center engages across a spectrum of global health, is health issues, including infectious disease, women's and children's health, and global health security. An important part of our work involves traveling to see U.S. health programs in action. And in many cases, we organize delegations to provide a broader set of perspectives to inform our reports and recommendations. Today's event is a result of one of those delegation trips. In February of this year, we took a delegation to Tanzania to look at U.S. engagement on maternal, neonatal, and child health. Our goal was to better understand the ways in which the U.S. supports the Tanzanian government in its efforts to reduce maternal mortality and improve child survival rates, as well as how the U.S. engages with multilateral partners, most notably Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. The delegation was led by Catherine Bliss, Senior Associate with the Global Health Policy Center, and Catherine Streifel, Program Manager and Research, Research Associate. Uh, in addition to myself, the other delegates were Ashley Colomb with Senator Warren's office, office Dana DeRyder from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Michael Gerson with the One Campaign and the Washington Post, Sarah Hank from Raven Martin, and Barbara Riley with Congressman Crenshaw's office. Each member of this group, who collec collectively represent experience in Congress, multiple administrations, advocacy organizations, foundations, and the private sector, made significant contributions to the trip as well as to the report that we are releasing today, which it was available as you walked in and hope you, hope you all grabbed a copy of. Uh, we chose Tanzania for a number of reasons. Tanzania has made strong progress in extending vaccine coverage throughout the country and is on track to meet its MDG target of reducing under five mortality. At the same time, the country has been less successful in reducing its maternal mortality rate and newborns still represent 40% of deaths among the under five. The one major goal of the trip was to better understand the reasons behind this divergent progress. In addition, the U.S. has a long-standing and comprehensive relationship with Tanzania on health issues. The Tanzanian government has recently rolled out major initiatives aimed at reducing maternal mortality and improving neonatal survival. A second aim of the trip was to see how the U.S. is working to support the Tanzanian government in those efforts. Over the course of the six-day trip, we met with U.S. and Tanzanian officials, as well as NGO and civil society representatives, and we conducted site visits to health facilities in both Dar es Salaam, Tanzania's largest city and economic hub, and Mwanza, a rural region bordering Lake Victoria that has lagged behind on almost all health indicators. Throughout the trip, we received exceptional support from both, both U.S. and Tanzanian governments, as well as a wide range of international and local implementers, health workers, <coughs> mothers, fathers, caretakers, and at one site in particular, children, all of whom went out of their way to ensure that we had a productive trip. So a big thank you to everybody who was involved in that work. Uh, in a moment, I will turn things over to Catherine and the panel, uh, who will discuss the major observations and recommendations that we make in this report. Before I do that, uh, we are very excited this morning to unveil a new product that we have developed to share what we saw in Tanzania. An honorary member of our delegation was Sala Lewis, an extraordinarily talented photographer who lives in Dar es Salaam and who traveled with the group and captured what we were seeing. We have created a dedicated website that combines the main points of the report with her images as well as some other graphics and visuals. Our goal is to create a more visually engaging product that might reach a broader audience. So that's what you're seeing above me on the screen. Um, and we're just gonna run through a couple features of the site. Um, you can find this, the website is maternaltz .csis.org, um, and when you go into it, uh, this is your front page. Before we scroll down, there's a little menu at the top uh, where you can also, there's a number of footnotes throughout if you want to see our sources. You can also download the full PDF report that uh, we have been handing out this morning, so if you want to get that that way, uh, you can access it there. Um, and then if you start scrolling down, what you'll see is 
um, a reduced and uh, slightly restructured text that is mixed in with some of the spectacular images that Sala was able to capture from the trip. Um, and we've also added in some maps and some graphs and some data points um, that hopefully will allow some of the information that we include in the report to uh, become a little bit more accessible and more usable. Um, you can open any of the various graphs as Paul is doing now, get bigger pictures of it, um, and there are slideshows throughout, so you can you can click through some of the images. Um, there's places where there's some places where you can expand if you want more details. Uh, you know, you can skip that if you want, but if you want the more details, they're there. And then we conclude at the bottom with our recommendations. And if you want to print this particular site as a PDF, sorry, it's long, um, <laughs> you can do that at the bottom. And then you get all the pictures as well. So, um, so we hope that this will be useful to all of you as uh, you know, we please share this widely. Um, again, the site is uh, maternaltz, Tanzania, uh, .csis.org. Um, please uh, give us any feedback. Uh, this is one of the uh, you know, first times that we're doing this particular model, and so we're very interested in hearing what you think, whether it's useful, um, you know, any feedback that you have, please let us know. Uh, this site was created and designed by Paul Franz and Allison Bors of CSIS, uh, who went above and beyond uh, to put this together and get it, get it up in time for this morning's event. So a big thank you to them for all their work. Um, with that, I will now turn things over to Catherine, uh, who will get the conversation started. Thanks again for joining us. Talia, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to all of you here this morning. Um, it's my pleasure to um, be able to open a conversation um, here with our panelists and with you, the audience, uh, this morning about the future of United States engagement on maternal, neonatal, and child health today. Now, the occasion um, of today's event is the, the launch of the delegation report and the web microsite that Talia has just described. Um, but I really hope that we can use the observations and recommendations in the report as a platform for a much broader discussion about challenges and opportunities in the areas of global maternal, neonatal, and child health issues. Uh, Talia has already uh, spent a bit of time describing our February, um, the delegation's uh, goals and agenda in February. So let me just take a few minutes to share um, some of the observations and recommendations from the delegation report uh, before we move into the discussion. So basically you'll see, I think when you came in, you, you were able to receive a copy of the hard copy of the report. Um, you could see this on the website as well. We essentially had four um, overarching observations after our eight days, um, a very brief trip really, but um, we were able to cover a lot of ground, both uh, I think topically as, as well as geographically, um, but basically four observations. One, uh, the government of Tanzania has launched two high profile initiatives, uh, the Sharpened One Plan and Big Results Now which are intended to improve maternal, neonatal, and child health outcomes in the country. But there are funding gaps in the health sector overall and for maternal, neonatal, and child health too. As the country moves from being a low income economy to a lower middle income economy, um, and this is actually a goal of one of those efforts, the Big Results Now effort, um, but as it begins to transition uh, from eligibility uh, with some multilateral and bilateral funding partnerships, there may be greater gaps, uh, funding gaps in the years to come. Tanzania has strong bilateral and multilateral um, partnerships uh, that offer external support. But as the country moves, um, uh, as the um, United States, and we found that the United States is investing critical resources, um, important resources in critical training programs, mentorships, and supply chain reform to help improve maternal, neonatal, and child health. But the needs in Tanzania, particularly at the community level, remain great. Programs to expand coverage, uh, this is number three, programs to expand uh, vaccine coverage have been highly successful, thanks in large part to the support provided to the government of Tanzania by Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, um, and other partners, but reaching the most, pop most remote populations remains a challenge. And you know, a fourth observation was that I'll know, although not always explicitly framed as maternal, neonatal, and child health initiatives, kind of broadly speaking, PEFAR support supported programs are nevertheless helping to link women and children to a much larger array of um, maternal, neonatal, and child health services. But there are limits to the extent to which PEPFAR's program can address the broader population's maternal, neonatal, and child health needs. 
So the four recommendations, which you can, you can see in greater detail in the report, um, are these. Um, one, um, focus health, health system strengthening support, including training and commodities and supply chain reform for maternal, neonatal, and child health on activities at the community level. Um, we heard time and again that in Tanzania, the community or the, the population is, is largely, you know, rural based. And so, you know, getting those services out to the communities where people are, are based and needing to seek them is, is, is critically important. Um, second, use, success, use the successful uh, vaccine partnerships that have been developed as a model for other services and programs. Um, we, we suggest that it, it may be helpful or useful to consider how to better integrate um, the provision of immunizations and voluntary family planning services, um, as well as you know, there may be lessons that can be learned from, um, from the uh, um, extension of, of immunizations into some of the remote areas for other kinds of services as well. Third, um, consolidate and protect the maternal, neonatal, and child health gains realized through PEPFAR, but recognize that they are not sufficient uh, to fulfill the human resource, commodity, and financial needs required for further reductions in maternal and child mortality. And finally, strengthen the dialogue, you know, continue to, to build on and strengthen a bilateral and multilateral dialogue around domestic resource mobilization for maternal, neonatal, and child health to um, begin to plan well into the future for, um, for um, increasing domestic funding for, for such important activities. So what I propose to do this morning is to use these observations and recommendations to launch a conversation about broader challenges and future directions related to maternal and child health in the sub-Saharan African region, particularly, but, but more broadly in general. Um, here to help us answer some of these questions are four experts in the fields of policy and programming around maternal and child health and health financing. Um, to, let's see, to my immediate right, uh, I have Koki Agarwal, uh, director of USAID's Maternal and Child Survival Program uh, based at Japaigo. Um, to my far right, uh, Natasha Bilamoria, Director for United States Strategy at Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, um, and based in the DC office here. Um, to my left, um, Aliala Nanda Kumar, uh, USAID's Chief Economist for Global Health and also a professor at Brandeis University. And to my, um, to my left here, Heather Watts, uh, Coordinator for Maternal and Child Health uh, within the Office of the United States Global AIDS Coordinator uh, based in Washington, DC. So I'd like to start um, by posing a question uh, to Koki. Um, you know, on our trip to Tanzania, uh, we learned, the delegation uh, learned, that the country has made considerable progress in reducing child mortality, thanks in large part to both immunizations as well as vitamin A supplementation and an increase in malaria prevention and, and treatment activities, among others. Um, but we heard uh, both in Dar es Salaam and in Mwanza and in many of the different sites that we visited that reductions in maternal mortality have been more difficult to achieve and newborn deaths still account for about 40% of deaths of, um, um, among children under the age of five. So Tanzania is not unique in experiencing these um, successes in child health on the one hand and challenges around maternal and neonatal health on the other. So I'd like to ask you to kind of kick off our discussion um, and share your perspective of, you know, what do you see as the most important obstacles uh, to success when it comes to the maternal and newborn health uh, piece, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa? Can you tell us a bit about uh, what USAID's maternal and child survival program, uh, what steps that the program will be taking over the next few years to accelerate uh, progress in this area in the priority countries? And, um, you know, if you could give us a sense of how you see things evolving over the next five to, to 10 years. <laughs> so, thank you. Thanks, uh, Kathleen. It's really an honor for me to be here and share some perspectives with you uh, based on our working uh, as a USAID's uh, flagship program in several countries. And I think that you, uh, the report itself and what you mentioned uh, as your perspectives and observations from your recent trip to Tanzania really um, outline and lay out what maybe many countries in sub-Saharan Africa are um, experiencing as well, that they might have been able to have gains in child, uh, uh, reducing child mortality, but they haven't seen the similar gains in maternal and newborn mortality. And I think part of the uh, reason for this is that um, maternal affecting and impacting maternal mortality and newborn health is really a health systems issue. And it needs for us to look at the household to hospital continuum of care and what needs to be done. 
Uh, many years ago, uh, we had um, uh, ex experts who had mentioned the three delays uh, <coughs> relating to addressing maternal mortality. The first being the fact that women don't seek care and the decision to seek care is uh, is the first delay. The second delay may be getting to a facility. And the third delay is the kind of care that you receive at the facility. And we know that for addressing maternal newborn health, uh, we need to address all of these. Uh, as the report and other uh, statistics from Africa highlight, uh, more than 40 to 50% of the births are still happening in the house uh, with unskilled uh, trained, uh, unskilled attendants or just a household member. And so we need to make sure that those women who are delivering in the house are, um, if they're not reaching a service uh, that will provide a skilled attendant, which is going to be the safest outcome, that they have some opportunities to prevent uh, complications like postpartum hemorrhage or, uh, you know, have, uh, for the newborn health, they have opportunities to have essential newborn care at the household level. And those are the th challenges that uh, countries are uh, finding it difficult to address. I think uh, making the decision to uh, reach a facility is also another big challenge. Many communities don't have referral systems in place or transport systems in place. And then we, <laughs> under the previous project that USAID had funded, we had done a quality of care assessment in almost seven uh, countries in um, sub-Saharan Africa. And many of these countries, while we, we did direct observation of what the skilled attendants were able to provide, and even if you have a trained skilled attendant, which may not be the case in many countries because of the human resource shortages, we see that they are unable to provide the standards-based uh, care that is needed for um, managing the main complications because there may be lack of commodities, there may be lack of equipment, or they just may not have adequate training that they received as part of their uh, pre-service education. So I, I think that there's things that we need to address at all levels, and we need to have a, you know, a dual approach to addressing this in uh, countries where we work, including working at the community, improving referral, using innovative strategies of um, using M-Health approaches, and then making sure that the facilities are ready to receive women as we create an uh, opportunity for them to deliver with a skilled attendant. I uh, also just came back from Tanzania, and I have to share, you know, one of the regions that USAID's uh, pro uh, project is working in is Kagera, very close to Mwanza which is one of the hard to reach areas uh, very, with very poor indicators. And the largest maternity that we visited had um, had only five or six beds with at least uh, 20 women, uh, many of them lying on mattresses, three to a mattress, and uh, there was no separate newborn ward. So there are, compli you know, there are really strong challenges that exist at the health center hospital level. And many women will not come in because they feel like they're not going to get the services that they should get when they go into a facility. So even if the government is really trying hard, which I know Tanzania has many uh, initiatives in place, including what Kathleen mentioned, like the big results now, a sharpened one plan. They're working to develop a new uh, RMNCH plan, which is going to address a continued focus on uh, addressing maternal newborn mortality. Well, we need to make sure that we also address the challenges that exist at the health center level. And equip these facilities so that we are not shifting the deaths that happen at home to a facility level. So I, I think that just laying out those are the main challenges I see. And then at the facility level, we know that there are human resource shortages, which is a big issue in some of the sub-Saharan African countries. We need to make sure that we are working with uh, professional association, faith-based group, private sector, to see how we can uh, utilize every resource possible to um, have uh, human resources uh, shortages addressed at these facilities and uh, use um, you know, a task shifting approach, making sure that if physicians are not there, nurses and midwives are able to provide services. I think another aspect of um, challenges for maternal newborn health is um, an integrated focus on family planning side by side as we uh, uh, assure that we are providing maternal health services. We know that family planning can reduce maternal mortality and newborn mortality by almost 30 percent. And we need to make sure that when we are um, working in these facilities to provide essential maternal care, we also provide postpartum family planning so that women um, who have an unmet need for family planning leave with a method of their choice or are able to access uh, a method of their choice 
as they move forward. Pookie, can, can I interrupt for just one second? Uh, we've just received a notice that there is an unclaimed bag at the front of the building. Um, so I would just want to ask everyone to check for their bags because if the bag is not claimed, then they will take steps to um, enhance the security of the building and, and perhaps evacuate. So if you are missing a bag, um, <laughs> please <laughs> please go claim it at your earliest opportunity. Um, sorry about that, please. No, no, not at all. <laughs> so I was just going to move into what uh, US, uh, the Maternal and Child Survival Program is focusing on. And our vision is to see that every country that we work in is uh, you know, self-reliant and able and equipped with tools and approaches and effective systems so that they are able to end preventable uh, child and maternal mortality. And we are working in about 20 of the 24 priority countries that USAID has um, uh, narrowed down uh, based on the burden of disease and the problems that these uh, countries are facing for maternal, newborn, and child health. And our approach is to really enhance country ownership um, making sure that we work to support the health system and uh, try and focus more so now on the district level and making sure that we are strengthening the district health systems to not only manage the issues and problems, but also prioritize and uh, you know have resources that are needed for supporting the health systems to enhance the numbers of deliveries and uh, essential newborn care that might be needed at the facility level. So we are really trying to work with the uh, health system and looking at all of the different players that might exist in that district, whether it's the faith-based uh, hospital or whether it's the private sector or individual providers who can all contribute uh, in a unified, co comprehensive manner to support the uh, maternal mothers and the newborns. Um, I, I think that the other aspect I wanted to highlight was looking forward in terms of um, where I see things might go. I, I feel that this is a really um, great time to support maternal newborn health initiatives. Uh, there's a, a really strong global commitment, uh, country level commitment as, a, as we are uh, you know, reaching the MDG, uh, end of the MDG era and starting a new initiative on the sustainable development goals while the maternal health, the MDGs have really driven some countries into uh, sharpening their focus on these issues. We want to make sure that this continues under the sustainable development goals. And there are initiatives like the uh, Every Newborn Action Plan and uh, Ending Preventable Maternal Mortality that multiple partners, uh, WHO, UNICEF, USAID, and multiple partners have worked on together that can provide the impetus to these countries. In addition to other things that we will hear about, the global financing facility and the ability for these countries to get health system strengthening grants from the Global Fund. So I'm really hopeful and uh, I'm a, I'm a born optimist, I think. I'm really hopeful that these countries are going to really benefit from this environment at this point and take the challenge and continue to strive to work towards ending preventable maternal and newborn mortality. Well, thank you very much. Um, Natasha, I want to turn to you because uh, we've heard a bit about the, the maternal and neonatal challenges um, when, we, when our delegation was, was in Tanzania. We also heard quite a bit about the really extraordinary partnership between the government of Tanzania and uh, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and, and the many different partners that, um, that work to support that partnership. Um, we we understood that you know in a relatively short period um, since the inception of Gavi, really uh, the government has been able to scale up um, and make remarkable progress in expanding immunization coverage, introduce a number of new and underutilized vaccines, and um, engage in a very successful co-financing arrangement as well. So I just wanted to ask you um, if you could reflect a bit on some of the factors that have made um, extending immunization coverage in Tanzania so successful. Um, what lessons uh, from Tanzania and expanding coverage um, and co-financing do you think can be shared with other countries in the region? And you know, one of the, the goals of the Big Results Now program is for Tanzania to reach that lower uh, middle income economy status. And so as that happens and its eligibility for um, Gavi and, and other kinds of support changes, how is Gavi you know, thinking about working with, with countries in that, in that kind of situation uh, to plan for graduation and others? Sure. Thanks, Catherine, and um, and thanks. 
Awesome. Um, thanks uh, to CSIS and Senator Warren for putting this together, and congratulations on the report and the microsite. Um, it's really great to see all of it uh, come together after I know a lot of work <laughs> went into the trip and, uh, and all of it. Um, so, you know, Tanzania really has been a great story um, uh, and has really shown how a country um, can succeed in, a, in, in particular ways when the right factors really converge. And um, as Catherine said, uh, Tanzania became a Gavi partner country in 2001. And um, we've had very strong collaboration with the government, other development partners that are part of the alliance, UNICEF, WHO, um, <clears throat> as well as NGOs. And, and because of all of that, Tanzania has really made some significant progress in reducing preventable child deaths. Um, the routine immunization rate um, at the time Gavi came in in 2001 was at 76%. And in 2013, we're now at 92%. Um, and uh, and th what's great about these numbers is that it's actually equally distributed among wealth, wealth quintiles, but also between um, rural and urban divide. Um, so, so again, by all intents and purposes, successful. Um, and I think there were probably three key issues in my mind that really led to this. Um, the first was an incredibly high level of political commitment. Um, I think that commitment on the highest level um, all the way down really provides a solid basis um, for the support countries need to implement any kind of health program, and obviously including immunization. And it really helps uh, work to overcome challenges that can arise. And in Tanzania, we've really seen that at all levels. Um, and in particular, President Kikwete, I think, has been a huge champion for global health, um, and immunization in particular. He actually attended our um, replenishment conference in January and um, uh, really spoke to donors directly, really um, acknowledging all of their support and really meeting Gavi's replenishment goals and how much that would lead to better health for children in his country, um, but also all over the world. Um, the second factor I think that has played an important part is really, um, you know, having a strong uh, and competent EPI manager. Um, EPI is the Expanded Immunization Program, and technically speaking, but also managerially speaking. And I think, you know, all of us here know how important, just like in any job, how important um, management is to the, to the success of a program. And the EPI manager in Tanzania who oversees, um, you know, this program it's comprised of a lot of different priorities from costing and financing, cold chain logistics, surveillance and reporting. And I think the strong leadership has really been critical to ensuring all of these programs um, run well and are run um, in coordination with each other. And then finally, I think a third factor is really around a well-resourced um, EPI team. And, you know, that really has been the case in Tanzania. Um, and also, again, strong local support from other partners in the alliance have really created a partnership um, that has uh, allowed Tanzania to really benefit and improve their immunization systems. Um, as far as, uh, you know, lessons learned, I think obviously these three key factors are critical and I think, um, you know, the more we see that in other countries, um, you know, I think we see similar kinds of um, impact. Um, <clears throat> but I also think that another important lesson with Tanzania has been really the strong interaction that they've had with civil society organizations on the ground. Um, I know many of us who are in global health really understand, you know, how critical CSOs and NGOs are to the success of global health programs because they really bridge the gap between communities and governments and other global health actors like Gavi on the ground. So as an example in Tanzania, um, Lions Club International, um, who is partnered with Gavi, um, really helped raise awareness um, with Tanzanian health workers in the community, um, and particularly about the dangers, dangers about um, measles and rubella, which is um, the particular issue Lions Club is interested in. And this work was really pivotal um, to the success of a um, campaign that Tanzali Tanzania led um, last October, and tar it targeted 21 million children with the goal of achieving 95% coverage um, during that time. And so this type of CSO support has really been essential 
to strengthening the vaccine programs as well as the health systems. And, you know, give, in Tanzania in particular, given that NGOs, CSOs provide 43 percent of all the medical services in the country, these partners are really able to help ensure strong um, health outcomes. And I think another um, area that can be learned from is, you know, it's, it's really important to have a functioning delivery infrastructure and good health systems. Um, I think these have been words that have been talked about a lot um, over time, and especially, especially in the recent past with Ebola. But the bottom line is, is public health gains, um, you know, of vaccines or any other health intervention can really only be fully realized when you've got a system that's strong enough to support the uh, specific intervention. And one thing I just want to point out is while, um, you know, the U.S. has been a huge um, partner, contributor, and champion of Gavi since the beginning, um, you know, the funding that um, the U.S. provides goes uh, solely to the uh, purchase of vaccines. But Gavi um, also provides health system strengthening support um, with, uh, with other funding. And I think the flexibility in our health systems support really allows countries, um, as they're looking at introducing new vaccines, to identify and target the barriers within their health systems that stand in the way of increased access to immunization, um, as well as other um, child and uh, maternal health issues. And in particular, um, our health system strengthening um, support um, to Tanzania has really helped uh, strengthen the capacities at the district and the local level through training of healthcare workers, improving data management, um, really engaging the community and civil society in those communities, uh, importantly, um, improving cold chain systems and, and ensuring the transport um, of vaccines to rural or underserved communities. I mean, as we heard, this has been a difficult um, thing for immunization, and we're obviously working to continue to improve that with the country. But I think overall these investments have real, are targeted um, really at building up the immunization system, but at the same time can really be leveraged um, to provide a platform um, for which other key maternal and child health interventions can actually be delivered. And then finally, on graduation, um, again, this is something um, that I think we're all talking about, um, long-term sustainability of any program, um, immunization or otherwise, um, is, is critical. That's why we're all doing this work. And, and obviously, in the end, um, that's, that's really our goal. And with Gavi, our vaccine support is really um, done through country demand. So countries ask um, for support for the vaccines that they um, want to introduce. But at the same time, we also require all countries, regardless of income level, to actually pay something for their new vaccines. Um, so this co-financing contribution is um, based on a country's ability to pay, and, um, and countries in, in the Gavi world are really divided into three areas, low income, intermediate, and then graduating groups. And currently, uh, Tanzania is um, classified as a low income country, and so that means its co-financing share for each vaccine is 20 cents per dose, um, and there's no annual increase um, to that, again, because they are considered a low income country. But to date, Tanzania has contributed almost $15 million um, to the cost of the Gavi-supported vaccines. So they have very much been a part of um, supporting these vaccine programs uh, with domestic resources. Um, and Tanzania is still um, uh, a bit distant from the graduation threshold for Gavi. Um, but as Catherine said, I mean, supporting a successful transition um, for countries as Gavi's support ends is really a cornerstone to our catalytic model. And there have been a lot of discussions going on, and the board will be discussing more um, in about a month, um, approaches on how to you know, even more successfully support these transitions um, of Gavi countries, building on the existing policies we have um, to bolster the sustainability of national immunization programs as Gavi support starts to decrease. Um, but like any, all, many other African countries, long-term sustainability um, is going to be difficult. And um, Tanzania's programs um, has, uh, they have faced some challenges um, in sustaining 
uh, or it could face some challenges, excuse me, in sustaining that high level of immunization coverage, as, and I think particularly in expanding um, the vaccinations um, to the hardest to reach places. And that's really the part of the program where in our next strategic cycle, Gavi uh, overall will be focusing a lot on the issues of coverage and equity and making sure that the most vulnerable populations are reached in this next period. Um, I think some of the key challenges um, on this really have been a shortage of human resources and a lot of turnover of healthcare workers. That was, uh, you know, Koki, you mentioned that. Um, and, uh, and I think, again, the, difficult, the access to getting to remote um, areas, you know, I think that has also um, been a challenge for the country. And, but these are also challenges that are faced by many countries in, um, in Africa. And, you know, again, through our health, systeming, health system service, health system strengthening grants, we're really working with countries to target these bo bottlenecks um, or barriers within the healthcare system um, as a way to increase access of immunization and other um, MNCH services in the country. But I think if we really hope to see that continued success, yeah, um, you know, overall we are going to have to see enhanced efforts to strengthen the capacity of health systems um, in the country uh, to provide immunization and other health services. And so at Gavi, we're looking forward to continuing that strong um, partnership in Tanzania, as well as with the United States to really ensure that these programs can, the immunization programs can continue to be successful and really sustain themselves in the long term. Natasha, thank you. And um, I should have mentioned at the beginning that we were fortunate our first day, of the delegations, actually the, the first, our first, first full day of meetings to have Stefano Lazari from the Gavi Secretariat in Geneva join us uh, for some of the discussions. He works with the Anglophone uh, country team there. And um, so we really thank Gavi for, for their support on our trip as well. Um, Heather, let me turn to you. Um, in, in Tanzania, when, when the delegation was there, we, we learned a great deal um, at essentially every site that we visited about the important ways in which um, PEPFAR supported activities um, for maternal and child health, such as prevention of mother-to-child transmission, um, early infant diagnosis of HIV, um, and, and other programs are really serving as platforms for the introduction and, and access to um, other maternal, neonatal, and child health services. And obviously, Tanzania is not the only country where the PEPFAR platform has really contributed to a broader strengthening of the health system and, and uptake of health services overall. And so I just wanted to ask you if you could explain a bit about how PEPFAR programs um, can, you know, contribute to uh, broader maternal, neonatal, and child health outcomes. And then, you know, one thing that we heard quite a bit about uh, was the, the refocus um, that, that is going on as PEPFAR programs are kind of re, refocused on the highest burden areas uh, in the 3.0 plan or 3.0, um, what measures will be taken to kind of ensure um, that the gains realized as a result, um, the maternal and child health gains, you know, realized as a result of PEPFAR support can be maintained even as the overarching program kind of moves to focus on the highest burden areas? So, please. Great. Is this on? Yeah, it should be. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate um, the opportunity to be here. I thank CSIS and Dr. Warren's office, or Senator Warren's office. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so um, let me just review. Obviously, PEPFAR um, started a little over a decade ago and has provided an incredible platform for uh, strengthening health systems and contributing to maternal, newborn, and child health. Obviously, Human Resources for Health, um, both pre-service training, the NEPI and MEPI programs, in-service training, and trying to integrate PMTCT into maternal child health um, setting and providing dual training for a lot of healthcare workers. There's been a lot invested in supply chain management, obviously directed initially at um, HIV rapid test kits and antiretroviral drugs, but that can be tapped into. We try to work with national s systems to improve those. Blood safety is another focus of PEPFAR, which has allowed safe transfusion services for management of obstetric hemorrhage. Um, we've helped develop strategic information systems to try to allow monitoring of implementation and the results. 
um, demand creation for antenatal care, and which allows HIV testing and obviously provision of care and treatment for HIV uh, positive pregnant women and uh, screening for their infants. Integration of screening for tuberculosis, which is a major cause of morbidity and mortality, especially in HIV positive women, but also in women in general in the reproductive ages. Um, and improved screening and obviously provision of antiretrovirals for lim women living with HIV to uh, prevent transmission in the current pregnancy, but also mater uh, maintain maternal health. As you know, the maternal mortality in women who are living with HIV can be up to eight times higher than in the background population. Some of that's tuberculosis, some of it's um, sepsis. There are a whole host of reasons, but we're hoping um, as getting rolling out B plus and lifetime treatment for pregnant women that will improve maternal health and reduce the HIV-related component of maternal mortality. We've also included enhanced counseling and nutritional support for breastfeeding <coughs> among women living with HIV to provide uh, the best start for their infants. So there's been a, a huge investment in health system strengthening that has provided a platform for MNCH. Um, obviously, a lot of you have probably heard about uh, PEPFAR 3.0, or the PIVOT, as it's called. And I think, um, first of all, to give you the background on that, we're really at a crucial juncture um, with the HIV epidemic. We know we have treatment available now. We know by identifying uh, infected people and getting them on treatment that it not only improves their health, but almost eliminates their risk of transmission to their partners. So it's very crucial. And if you look at, um, we sort of have to either intensify and really double down on our efforts in the high burden areas and reduce transmission now, or we're going to have a huge burgeoning of the epidemic, especially as we see the uh, youth bulge in Africa and, and young women entering into the peak time for HIV infection. So, that's the idea behind the pivot. So the idea is that we can um, focus on the highest burden areas. PEPFAR started as an emergency plan. We were rolling it out everywhere because that's what seemed to need to be done. We now have data to show us that in some areas we've been testing HIV positive, or we've been testing pregnant women for years, and we haven't identified any positives. There are as many as 60 percent of sites in some countries where we've never identified a positive pregnant woman. Now, why would we put our limited resources into continuing to test and roll out treatment and training and all um, where, where it's not doing any good? So the idea with the pivot is we're going to focus on those areas with the highest burden, and we're going to intensify our services. And I think that this will obviously provide um, better care for pregnant women in those areas who are identified as HIV positive. We're going to tap into community health workers and civil society organizations to try to improve um, access to care, to improve services, to improve identification, and to get women on to treatment and to keep them on treatment. We know if we look at PMTCT rates, two thirds of our transmissions are now occurring after delivery. So we're doing a fairly good job with getting women identified during pregnancy and getting them onto ARVs. But then we're not doing a great job of keeping them on care necessarily during breastfeeding. So we, we need to intensify our efforts. So the whole idea of the pivot is you can take um, the services and deliver them in the areas with the high burden and really intensify services to identify. We're um, working in general to get 90% of people to aware of their status, 90% of those on treatment, 90% suppressed. In pregnant women, we really want to make sure we're getting at least 95% of the pregnant women tested and 95% of those on treatment. So in the areas with high burden, our intensified services should lead to better outcomes for the mothers and the infants, and we'll also generalize to, again, <coughs> increased demand creation for antenatal care, increased support um, for antenatal care in general, increased support for follow-up of the um, infants for immunizations for early infant diagnosis. Um, it can also lead to improved efficiency in the areas where we're just not identifying pregnant women. So instead of spending a lot of time trying to test lots of pregnant women who are not going to have HIV, we can spend more time on other other things in antenatal care, um, um, family planning education, syphilis screening, immunizations, whatever. 
Um, the other thing that I should say, everybody looks at the pivot and they hear about the geographic refocusing, which is what I'm talking about with the high burden areas, um, and also um, the core, non-core, near-core um, activities so that some of the activities that PEPFAR has done may be transitioned. But I want to emphasize that another key component is still the health system strengthening component of PEPFAR. So. Um, <coughs> Even though we're doing geographic refocusing, we're still providing a large amount of money to health system strengthening um, to, again, continue to support um, human resources for health with training, um, improve commodity and supply chain, blood safety. The idea with a lot of this health system strengthening now is to um, look at transitioning to sustainability so that as we're strengthening supply chain, the idea is that we're improving it for the country to allow um, eventually transfer to country ownership and sustainability. Blood safety, there's been accreditation processes developed. We're working to help the countries get their blood banks accredited and be able to maintain those. There'll be continued support for the um, health management information systems. PEPFAR now is all about data, so we're not going <laughs> to abandon our, um, our pursuit of better data. Um, and TB is, will remain a major um, effort, so enhancing TB screening in general. So again, I want to reemphasize we're still um, supporting the health system strengthening activities to a great extent, and we're going to be providing better services to the areas with the highest burden to really turn the, the corner on the epidemic. Heather, thank you very much. Um, let, me, let me turn to um, Nanda, Dr. Nanda Kumar, Nanda, <laughs> to, um, to uh, um, tell us just if you could, you know, in Tanzania, the delegation learned about these very high profile commitments to maternal and child health, sharpen one plan and big results now, um, but challenges at the same time when it comes to mobilizing domestic resources uh, for maternal and child health and, and health activities in general. Uh, we learned that the government is putting together plans to extend health coverage, um, but at present, the population's out of pocket spending on health for, for all kinds of services remains quite high. Um, I know that you and, and others have been um, carrying out research uh, in the region to um, understand you know, more about domestic and external resources for health. I want to ask you to share a little bit about what you are learning um, about uh, resource mobilization for, for health in general and, and what you can about maternal and child health. Um, say a bit about how the United States can help countries prioritize and finance health programs. And um, so if you could share some of that with us, um, that would be helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. I want to begin by start uh, by thanking Senator Warren's office and CSIS for inviting me to be here. I'm I'm glad to be invited as an economist because we have a very weird, a very peculiar way of looking at the world, which I'd like to share with you. L let, let me start by saying that economic transition, especially in Africa, is real. Right? If you go back to 2000, domestic revenues of the sub-Saharan African countries accounted for 100 billion dollars. In 2010, they accounted for 500 billion dollars. Okay. Now, if you take um, uh, Tanzania, in 2000, its per capita income in PPP terms, you know, purchasing power parity terms, was around 1,200. By 2020, it will be 3,700. Okay. If you take Kenya, Kenya will grow from $1,800 to $4,400. Nigeria will grow from $2,300 to $7,800. And South Africa will go from $7,900 to $15,000. So, so economic growth and economic transition is real, right? So it does create the fiscal space for countries to invest more in health. But we should always learn from history. And I want to acknowledge a colleague of mine, Caroline Lee, who's sitting there. Caroline and I have done a lot of this analysis together. So we looked at what was, were the trends in health spending between 1995 and 2011 in the 24 countries that were, are of interest to USAID for ending preventable maternal child deaths. So in 1995, for countries that remained low income between 1995 and 2011, donor spending accounted for 13% of total health spending. In 2011, it accounted for 39% of total health spending. In 1995, there were three countries out of the 24 where donor spending on health exceeded government spending on health. In 2011, there were 11 countries where donor spending on health exceeded government spending on health. Okay. 
The other, there are some other interesting observations. When countries migrate to being low middle income, donor spending very rapidly declines from 39% to 9.5% of total health spending. And there is really no glide path, okay? When this happens, governments are not stepping in and making up the gap. So what you're seeing is really an uptick in out-of-pocket, the burden of out-of-pocket spending, right? As incomes grow, people spend more on health. That's the reality. Countries spend more on health. That rule applies, and this is called the first rule of health economics. So where does that money come from? It's really coming from an increase in out-of-pocket spending. In the presence of donor spending, governments have invested away from health. That, again, is a reality. And it, 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 and it is true for all of our 24 countries, but it is also equally true for Tanzania. In 2000, donor spending was 27% of total health spending, and government spending was at 25%. In 2011, donor spending was at 48%, and government spending was at 21%. And the share of the government budget going to health in almost every single country has declined over time. Okay. This is a very important thing to keep in mind. Okay. We talk about domestic resource mobilization, but it's important not to ignore history. The other interesting thing is, as incomes of countries increase, where governments put their money in healthcare is not in primary healthcare. They are increasingly investing away from primary healthcare into hospitals, more sophisticated technology, and tertiary care. So there are countries I know where 65% of government health spending is going for secondary and tertiary care. So while we have economic transition creates a tremendous opportunity, one cannot afford to sit back and relax. What we need is a very strategic and proactive engagement and a new way of doing business that will incent governments to put more money into health to begin with, and within health into HIV, AIDS, RM and ACH, and other services that are of interest to us and the global community. So this is, I think, I think we should keep this in mind. And if you just look at the funding gap for, um, for maternal child health, currently it is at $27 billion. Okay. In Tanzania, I mean, I saw your report. Your report is suggesting it's somewhere around $170 million. And in Tanzania, that gap is projected to increase to about $350 million by 2020. Where is this money going to come from? Okay. So it has to come from domestic resources, even as the donor community supports it. So as USAID, we have been implementing a very interesting initiative for, for Ambassador Burks. And this is around domestic resource mobilization for health with a sub-focus on ensuring sustainable financing for HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. And what are the big takeaways we are getting from it? And I think people have spoken to it. I think the first thing is you need very strong evidence-based advocacy around, around domestic resource mobilization. National health accounts go a long way but one thing to keep in mind is what we, are, we have to talk to ministries of finance and not just ministries of health. And ministries of finance speak a very different language. Okay? So what you have to go to them with is an economic argument that makes sense. For example, if you did not invest in these services, what does it do to direct foreign investment? What does it do to interest rates at which you can borrow? What does it do to economic growth? How does it affect various sectors? You know, how does it affect agriculture versus, versus mining versus other sectors? So an economic argument of the economic cost of inaction is something that they understand. So advocacy becomes a big part of the question. The second thing, and it has come out in what the other speakers have said, is you have to lead with an efficiency argument before you make a sufficiency request. Okay? So, and what ministries of health, or many of us who are health professionals mean by efficiency, is very different than what ministries of finance 
uh, view as efficiency, right? We view technical efficiency, and we need to get things done better at the facility level. Uh, and their point is, what is your optimization paradigm? You know, how are you prioritizing against competing demands? Uh, how do you ensure that uh, more of the dollar you spend reaches point of service? So, so they are looking at efficiencies. Uh, are, and in many can, countries, you will notice that budget execution is never at 100%. So how, before, if you're not executing at 100%, why are you coming and asking for more money, right? So, so I think the dialogue, advocacy with evidence is critical. Efficiency is critical. The third thing we absolutely need to do is you cannot ignore the private sector in this mix, okay? The, the private sector in many of these countries accounts for 70 to 80% of outpatient visits. So you have to explicitly bring them in to the, to, to the mix through innovative financing or through other methods. The good news is with increased fiscal space, you have the ability, you have, we have an arsenal of health financing tools that you can apply to the problem. Whether it's a problem of insufficient domestic resources, you know, you have tax policy and tax administration, you can have bonds, now people are talking about development impact bonds, you know, so you have more things. If it's a question of providers lacking incentives to treat the poor, you have financial instruments that you can bring to bear. If it is a lack of working capital, you have, for supply chain strengthening, there are financial instruments one can bear. If it is delayed payments to health workers, there is technology one can use. If there is a limited ability to pay, uh, there, are, there, are, there is insurance, there are vouchers, there are various things one can bring. So we have an arsenal of health financing instruments that we can bear, bring to bear. But one has to be strategic and understand that you have to align these instruments to achieve objectives of domestic resource mobilization. So, so domestic resource mobilization is the way to go. There is no other solution. Uh, that, I mean, I think we need to understand that and accept that as the reality of the world we're going to live in. And once we accept it, all of us at the global community need to align in our messaging. The solution cannot be if the U.S. government withdraws some of its money, we'll go to the global fund. <laughs> that is not the solution. Right? So we all have to come together and align and make sure that we give the kind of support that is needed, engage in the kind of dialogue that is needed to ensure more domestic resources go to health and within health to these things. I couldn't agree more that health system strengthening is, uh, is important and we have to focus on it. Bringing services closer to the poor, uh, to the community and the poor is another tremendous way of improving outcomes because in many cases, a big thing is distance to facility and the lack of ability to access services. And the third one is integration of services. So these are system improvements uh, that I think we should all focus on. I'll stop here and I can answer more Tanzania-specific questions if uh, we come up in discussions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, before we turn to some comments and, and questions from the audience, I want to ask our panelists if, if anyone wants, to, if you wish to respond to, to um, a comment that another one has made. Koki, please. I have a quick comment uh, based on uh, Dr. Nand Kumar's, um, you know, um, point about advocacy for domestic resource mobilization and making the case for the Ministry of Finance of the economic cost of inaction. I think one of the challenges that we um, know um, and are facing in uh, sub-Saharan Africa is that more and more the decision making has shifted to, for funding, has shifted to the region, to the districts or to yes. the county level. Yes. And you know, the challenge is that how do we make that case at those levels rather than at the national level. The data doesn't exist and it's very hard to make that case. So I think that's one aspect. If there's some you know, way that we could create that um, uh, information at the regional level so we can utilize that data to make the case for more domestic re uh, resource mobilization and set up priorities for the health systems at that uh, regional, at the district or the county level would be great. I think this is a terrific, this is an, an excellent point, Koki. And, mm -hmm. And, and we ran into this in Kenya as one of the priority countries for Ambassador Burks's initiative. So let me, in one minute, I'll tell you what happened in Kenya. So Kenya decentralized, 
right, the, its entire system to the 47 counties. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they took block grants and gave each of the counties block grants and said, you can invest it in, in whichever sector you want. But 60% of those block grants, when they were transferred, actually came from health at the national level. When it went to the counties, two things happened. Three things happened. Only 37% of the block grants, on average, were spent on health, with a low of 7%. Okay. The second thing that happened was, at the national budget, $20 million were set aside for ARVs, TB drugs, malaria drugs. Mm -hmm. When they went as block grants, the national government zeroed out their budget line item, and not a single one of the counties put a budget line item. Mm -hmm. Not one. Okay? And the third thing was that when counties were making decisions on what they were going to put their money into, they were more interested in buying equipment and vehicles and building facilities. Okay. To us, um, when we were doing this work for Ambassador Burks, this crisis uh, was an opportunity. So what did we do? So we decided to work with 10 of the counties on moving them from line item budgeting to program-based budgeting. Okay, so that's the first thing we did. So we said, so program-based budgeting forces you to look at what your outcome objectives are and then to be kind of then look at what are your in inputs you need to do. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do it just for HIV AIDS. We said, let's do this for health. And within that context, we will look at the maternal child health program, the HIV AIDS program. So that's the first thing we did. The second thing, so, so, so to your question, I think that's a huge opportunity that one can leverage uh, as this decision-making gets decentralized. And then we are doing uh, subnational health accounts at the county level. So we are understanding where the money is coming from, what it is being spent on. So in addition to just having data on the sources and the uses of funds, at the national level, we are doing it at the, at the county level. But also what we are combining that with is benefit incidence analysis because there's also a huge equity element to this. Mm -hmm. so, so if you do these three things, we're trying to do this, uh, and we're trying to work with the Council of Governors there to get some support behind th these initiatives. Thank you. Heather? Okay, well, I thank you all. I want to turn to um, and seek some comments and, and questions from the audience. Uh, we've got a, a mobile microphone that um, I'd like to... First, um, see if I could uh, turn to one of our delegation uh, members who has kindly joined us from New York this morning, uh, Sarah Hank, uh, Vice President at Rabin Martin, the global health strategy firm. And I'd just like to invite um, Sarah to offer some, some comments or pose the first question just to, to get us started. And um, for, as we move toward the questions, um, I've already introduced Sarah, but if when you get the microphone, if you could just say your name um, and affiliation just so that... Um, many of us in the room here know each other, but we've got a large web audience as well so that, um, so that uh, they can hear that as well. So Sarah, please. Thank you. Um, that was a fantastic panel. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. Um, hello, a very full room that I just noticed how <laughs> full was. Uh, <laughs> hi. Um, I want to just make four really quick points to give a little color from the delegation's experience. We were there like Catherine said, for just a week. But I think these four anecdotes or points or observations that we, we had really highlight the themes that have come out in this panel um, in, a, in a more specific way. Um, I think first, the thing that I heard from several, several panelists was the, and what we really experienced there was when we were in DAR hearing of the really impressive plans at the central level. Um, some of the most impressive plans I've, I've ever heard for strengthening maternal and child health services. Um, and thinking really creatively about how to, how to Im involve performance-based financing, how to address human resources for health, how to, how to address health system strengthening in a really innovative way. And, and then we were struck by, when we go to the field by how challenging it is to, to implement these really impressive plans at the central level, at the district, and really local level, and really remote areas. And so the points that have been discussed here about evidence-based advocacy at the district level and strengthening human resources and management skills at the, at the local level really rung true for us during that week. Um, 
The second point um, that was made about the value of bringing in um, the private sector, I think, as coming from Raven Martin, a global health consulting firm that, that does a lot of work with the global private sector, um, but also with the local private health sector and understanding how to bring those together. Um, it was really powerful to me. We had a lovely um, evening with a lot of folks working with the local private health sector, um, which is small in Tanzania, but, but growing. And um, it, it was powerful for me to, to see just how much that sector needs to be brought into these plans and brought into the fold in, in order to really make sure everyone is focusing on the, the same objectives. Um, the third point um, the, that was raised about the ministries of finance and ministries of health speaking a different language um, and operating in, in silos that don't often connect was ex very much came to life for us uh, while we were there. We had a number of meetings with the Ministry of Health and then had a joint meeting with the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Finance, which is I will never forget. Um, <laughs> um, the dynamics between the two were really interesting to observe, and it was very clear who held the decision-making power. Um, and I don't have to make that clear to this room who, who held that power. But, um, but seeing those dynamics and seeing just how siloed their discussions had been and just how clearly um, it would benefit for the two to be at the same table in these planning discussions more and more was, became very, very true for us um, on, in that week. And then I think the fourth point um, about the Gavi approach to domestic resource mobilization or progressive um, purchasing in and participating in the financing of the Gavi program was really uh, something that we all came away with as really impressed by um, and wondered if there are ways to examine that model um, outside of vaccine programs. Um, so I don't have a question, but um, because you, you had fantastic presentation. So thank you very much. I look forward to everyone else's. Sarah, thank you for, for sharing your thoughts. Let's, um, let's take a, an initial round of questions. Maybe we'll take uh, three questions. So if we could, um, let's see, start um, back here. I think there was someone in the, the third row um, in the blue, blue dress. <laughs> Can't quite tell. Uh, let's start there. Hi, thank you. Um, excellent presentations and discussion. And um, I'm Laura Shemp. I work with John Snow Incorporated I'm on the MCSP USAID funded project and also on a Gavi grant as well. And we've been supporting uh, the new vaccine introduction and activities in Tanzania since 2011. And I just want to build on the more recent points, um, particularly the last point about domestic resources, because one of the issues that we've been seeing, the government commitment is there, as, as was mentioned, and very good interagency coordination in terms of finance, uh, mobilization, and coordination, as well as technical coordination. But one of the biggest challenges they're facing um, is data use for better decision making, in which case they're doing, um, Tanzania actually has a very strong e-health strategy, which I think should also be mentioned, very much led by the Ministry of Health and their ICT unit. And they're working on an integrated logistics management information system to have better transparency across all of their commodities, vaccines included, as well as all, uh, all health commodities, as well as trying to link in data um, through the, through the administrative reporting system to have better quality in terms of their um, use of data. But with that, one of the things we found, and, and this was the point I wanted to raise with the financing, even though there is that strong commitment, we're just adding more things to that line item. And they have a dedicated line item for vaccines, which is highly um, valued and, and they have not defaulted on their payments. However, that is tied to GNP and therefore it only goes up so much, but yet we've added several new vaccines into the mix. So the problems that they're facing is they're paying more now for additional vaccines and less to be able to fund the recurrent operational costs that are required to deliver those vaccines. So the fuel for the vehicles and outreach sites, the ability to get um, per diems for staff to go 50 kilometers or more to find those children to vaccinate them or provide other integrated services. So I'm curious um, your impressions, and I'd love to talk to you about Kenya. Um, <laughs> One of my headaches these days, um, because this it is um, in Tanzania there is the commitment, but um, one of the things we're looking at is through their CCHPs, their council health pro health uh, plans to try and mobilize those domestic resources and get them focused around preventive health, because there is a tendency to go for curative over preventive, because curative is more of a revenue generator. So I'm curious how you work at the national level to get that on the agenda, but then also um, domestic, uh, at the domestic and subnational levels to really make sure that that preventive public health focus is maintained as a priority. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Let's take another couple of questions. Uh, let's see, um, just, yeah, right there, please. And then 
Hi, Jill Gay, What Works Association. My question is for Dr. Watts. How do you see incorporating into PMTCT PEPFAR's new gender strategy? And also, how do you see uh, collaboration between the PMTCT work you're doing and the DREAMS work? Okay, thanks. And one more question. Um, I guess we'll just stay on this side, then we'll, we can come over to this side. How about that? <laughs> Hi, Karen Lane, Office of HIV AIDS, um, USAID. I think my question might be for Dr. Nanda Kumar, but I'm not sure. It's about domestic resource mobilization, and we've talked a little bit about infrastructure problems and access to health care, but where my concern lands is on the health care workforce. And having worked in, the, in these clinics in Kenya for four and a half years, I would still choose to deliver at home. <laughs> um, <laughs> And we talk about task shifting, but right now I just see asking the same five nurses to go from doing 12 things to 20 things. And I'm curious, was there any conversation in Tanzania with their government about how do we grow the healthcare workforce, get people interested in being in nurses, but the payment issue is the other thing. Um, and was there discussion about domestic resource mobilization around salaries for nurses? Um, you mentioned the technology piece, that's one. Even if they could get paid on time, that'd be great. Um, but there's lack of interest as well because it's such a low paying position. And you know, we hear announced, when Kenyatta announced that he'd offer free delivery services and maternal child health care, I nearly lost my mind. I'm like, there's, <laughs> there's no health care staff to take care of the women. So something about human resources and what you feel came out of those discussions. So we have three questions here. One um, is broadly about uh, data for logistics and supply chain management. And, and I should add that when the delegation was uh, in Tanzania, we actually visited the medical stores department um, at the national level and the zonal level uh, with JSI to, to learn about some of that, that interesting work that is going on. A question um, f about PMTCT programs and then also a question about domestic resource mobilization. And Nanda, I might ask you also if you could say a little bit about the global finance um, facility, uh, which we heard about uh, when we were there as well. Oh, I can go first, Please. and then yeah. you have two questions, I guess. Okay. So the question about the gender strategy and then also how PMTCT interacts with DREAMS, and um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to mention the DREAMS initiative, um, which is a focus in um, 10 countries, but the idea of being implemented actually in all the countries as they're developing their country operational plans for prevention of HIV infection in young women. And obviously that's the ultimate um, it's prong one of the global plan is prevention in young women, and that's the ultimate way to eliminate transmission to infants, obviously, is to prevent the women from being infected in the first place. So I think um, the ANC platform and PMTCT programs offer us a great opportunity to try to educate women um, about the new gender strategy and about um, empowerment and things like that. But then also um, we're encouraging all of our DREAMS programs to link with their PMTCT programs. One of the biggest um, ways to reach out of school um, adolescent girls and young women is actually through these um, PMTCT programs because many of these women, um, young girls and women, present um, during pregnancy. So testing during pregnancy, education to remain negative, um, and then t and even including them, linking them into some of the other DREAMS uh, programs to try to maintain their negative status. Also to encourage um, partner testing um, I just saw something this morning about um, women who seroconvert during pregnancy, who get their HIV infection during pregnancy, represent about 2.7% of pregnant women, but they represent 25% of the cases of transmission to infants. Um, and obviously those are missed opportunities where when the woman was negative early in pregnancy, um, if we're not able to access their partners and find out their partners are positive and get those partners on treatment, we're not going to be able to prevent those infections. So I think that's obviously a, a key thing that we need to focus on. Does that kind of cover what you were getting at? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Koki, do you want to address the, some of the questions around human resources? That uh, yes, I up? can jump in there. I think that it's a really valid point. Uh, I feel uh, 
you know, I really feel for the provider who's sitting there we're seeing 50 women line up for antenatal care, and she's a single midwife trying to see all of them, and then we blame her for not providing adequate quality of care. I, I really do think it's uh, uh, a challenge for many of these facilities and uh, countries. But I, I think that, you know, there are opportunities for us to build um, some elements of the um, care pr care that women need uh, to support the women themselves to recognize what they can do for themselves, as well as work through community health workers to be able to target some delivery of certain certain interventions that they can do, uh, recognizing that everyone is not going to make it to the facility uh, as these countries transition towards more facility-based births. So I think that the program that we had worked on in several countries was looking at providing uh, mesoprostol for preventing postpartum hemorrhage through a community health worker program directly to the woman themselves uh, at the eighth month so that she could take it as soon as delivery as, as soon as her delivery was done and you know make sure that if she didn't make it to the facility she would be uh, her, she would be supported for not having postpartum hemorrhage so I think we need to continue to look for uh, broadening our uh, horizons and looking at who can provide those services, including strengthening the ability for women to, you know, take care of uh, issues and recognizing symptoms themselves. Thank you. And Nanda on the resources. Yeah, it's on. So, so t two observations. I think, um, I think this uh, human resources for health uh, is a problem, not, not just in Tanzania, but also in the United States. Uh, no, seriously, I mean, but I think one of the things that we have to look at is whether we can be agnostic to ownership. Okay, I mean, you, you, we cannot talk about leveraging the power of the private sector if all we talk about is a publicly financed, publicly delivered system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think, I th especially if you know, if you, if someone mentioned Kenya, I mean, Kenya, there is a vibrant private market out there. So how can you leverage this, right? That's the first thing we have to look at. Can we go from being agnostic and being smart about who are we going to get these services from? The second thing is there are uh, very interesting experiments globally. I mean, I, I can point to the Karuna Trust experiment in India where basically the management of public primary healthcare facilities have been handed off to a nonprofit NGO, and they get 85% of the budget okay, to provide the services. And they manage about 80 primary healthcare centers in hard to reach areas. And they're doing interesting things. They're using drones to deliver drugs. No, seriously. I mean, but they ensure that it is staffed, drugs are available, and they're able to do it for about 85 or 90 percent of uh, the budget that would have normally been spent. So I, my my submission is that one has to look at you know how do you use some of these newer ways of looking at the human resources problem. Right. The global financing facility I think is a very interesting concept and idea and to address the financing shortage, but not just address the financing shortage. I think, to me, there are many other things that make it more attractive. So what is the underlying premise of the global financing facility? If you look at the RM and ACH world, uh, this world gets a disproportionately low proportion of funding compared to the burden. I mean, there is, when I mean, you can take Tanzania and someone, I mean, one of the reports that came out said that Maternal child health, this burden is about 53% of the total burden of disease in the country and gets about 15% of the funds. Okay, so, so there is a funding gap that has to be done. But, and therefore the grand convergence to 2035 that was discussed is not going to be feasible without doing two things. One, bridging the funding gap, but using the monies smartly to invest in high impact interventions but simultaneously promote long-term financial sustainability. I think to me, those are the, that's, that's what makes it exciting. The other thing is the IDA leverage, right? So there is the ability to leverage IDA, correct? Which means that IDA goes to countries, but if the requirement is that if there's a country trust fund to which the IDA flows, then you will use it for maternal child health. It is dedicated, so you are, you are bounding, right? You're protecting funds going to RM and ACH. I think the global financing facility and the country level trust funds mm -hmm. can achieve that. I mean, I think this is still new. It's still being worked out. 
but I think it holds a lot of potential. Well, thank you. Um, we, we've come to the end of our time here, and uh, we, we have this room. We've been able to enjoy this room for just a very brief period this morning. So I want to give each of the panelists an opportunity um, to make some final remarks, if you, maybe 30 seconds or so, if you, would, if you would like to just offer some final thoughts or remarks on, on some of these issues, and um, then we'll offer some thanks. And, um, well, I would just like to say that I think that there's uh, a, a really f uh, great environment now for these countries to make changes and invest in the right uh, high-impact interventions that will reach um, the most uh, in need and make a difference. Uh, and I think that uh, as long as all of the donors and partners are working to support them together so that there's more efforts to recognize that there's a, a bigger market out there without uh, not just the public sector, that they can make a difference in their countries. Thank you. Heather? Yeah, I guess one thing that I um, didn't mention when I was talking about the PEPFAR pivot is that obviously we're not um, transitioning out of these sites overnight and that this is an ongoing dialogue between the host country governments and, and the PEPFAR programs and obviously um, will be done hopefully in a very thoughtful manner to uh, make sure that we try to maintain these systems because obviously we do um, want to see maintenance of the systems that have been built up over time. Great, thanks. I just wanted to echo Koki's uh, observations that I think we are at an incredibly exciting time in terms of the global health financing architecture. Domestic resource mobilization is possible. It is the way to go. But I think what we need to do is to, to change how we engage and how we work with countries to achieve it. All right, well, um, I want to take this opportunity to reiterate uh, thanks to Senator Warren's office and delegation member Ashley Kulam in particular for hosting this event and facilitating our presence in this beautiful space here today. I want to thank Barbara Riley from Representative Crenshaw's office for her advice and support in, in planning this session. I want to thank CSIS Global Health Policy Center staff, uh, particularly my colleague, Catherine Streifel, who was here, but I think she may have stepped out for a second, who both helped plan and, and lead the trip and also um, co-authored the, um, both the report and, and the, uh, the website uh, as well. Also to Talia Dubovi, who worked um, considerably on the website. To Paul Franz and Allison Bors of the CSIS iLab in external relations for their effort, advice, and considerable patience as we worked on developing this. Um, to Jesse Swanson and Ariane Ma Malekzade for their help uh, in managing this today. Uh, both the webcast and the smooth running of this event. Let me thank you for joining us here this morning, and please join me in thanking our panelists. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. 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 Thank you.